Hey guys, welcome to the Kevin Cho Show. And as as many of you guys know that I, I am getting out of the real estate game and my YouTube channel has been about all about real estate, but as I'm getting into the business acquisitions, I am trying to interview as many business owners who have just recently bought a business using creative finance or SBA loans so that I can get an insight of their business and how they found it and to kind of share the knowledge with you guys. And so today I have Don Miller out of Boise, Idaho. And he just bought, uh, well, not just, he just closed on a HVAC company. But pre prior to that, you bought a sprinkler business that I would love for to get, love to pick your brain about. Sure. So thank you so much, number one, for, you know, giving me, giving us 45 to one hour of your time because it is super valuable to me. So yeah, I appreciate you. it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I do want to talk about, you know, as I, like I told you a little off the camera, I, you and I was telling you about very short about where, where I'm heading, you know, as I'm exiting the real estate game, the creative financing space, what can I, what do I want to get into? And obviously it's, you know, it's businesses and I'm sure with any, there's number one, there's so many other businesses. So I want, I'd love to hear your opinion on why you chose, why, why you chose, why you decided to choose a sprinkler business mm -hmm. and how you fund it, how you found it, how you funded it, how you're operating it, how much money you're making. If you come feel comfortable sharing all of that. Sure. How you're delegating yourself and ultimately just to see how like the see the parallels between the real estate side and the and the business side yeah absolutely so uh, it's kind of a loaded question so first of all i mean just start me off like are okay. you just wanting the initial like how we got into it how we found it what are we looking for i so you started this the, the first business you bought was sprinkler Mr. Sprinkler Master. Yeah, Sprinkler Master. Yeah. So That's I'll just talk a company. little bit about it. So, you know, um, we moved to Boise area about three years ago and I've always been in the home improvement sales and I've been in that for over a decade. And so I knew that game very, very well. And then I had a brother that was also going to move down into the area of, out of the state of Washington. And he didn't want to go get a W-2. So I was just like, well, let's find a company to buy. And you can be the operator. I'll be the funder. And we'll, we'll, we'll just hit the ground running from there. So, you know, lo you know, looked at the most typical places, you know, biz by sell, you know, loop net, all of those places reached out to um, a few of those. Nothing really seemed to match or, or, or meet up. I really specialize in the home improvement spaces. Um, it's just, it's just what I know. Um, and so, uh, but lo and behold, I just like, well, why don't I just check Craigslist and see what's on Craigslist? Mm. And there, there was a company on there that was, that was posted and the owner wanted to retire. And, um, so I hit him up and then, it, you know, I didn't really think a whole lot of it. And then he wanted to meet. And so we met at a Denny's. And just had a conversation. <laughs> That's probably what they have in Idaho, right? Uh, Denny's or, you know, there's a lot of different diner type places over here. Um, actually, I don't know if it was a Denny's, but one of those types of, you know, old greasy spoon diners. Okay. Um, and uh, and then we visited about it and I, 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 I just kind of blew it off. I didn't really, I wasn't super fascinated with it. Um, just because I didn't know a whole know a whole lot about the sprinkler, and l when I say sprinkler master, it's residential sprinklers for like yards. Uh, it's not like commercial sprinklers or anything like that. It's yards and uh, install and repair stuff like that. And uh, and then a week later, he you know I told him I'd talk to my brother about it. And a week later, he hit me up and he said like, "Hey, did you talk to your brother?" I was like, yeah, I suppose I should actually, you know, do what I say I'm going to do and actually follow through, even if it wouldn't be a good fit. So we did anyway. So we we followed through. We had another meeting with him, him, him and my brother. And um, turns out we live in a desert. So it's a high demand for, you know, this type of work. And uh, and then, you know, I asked him, like, hey, are you, are you willing to carry for this? You know, and he said, yeah, I'd be, he'd be willing to carry. Wasn't really wow. too concerned because right now, I mean, just to give you a snapshot of where the business was, it was doing gross about 160,000 gross. So just tiny, you know, wasn't a big company at all. How many, do you call them routes? Like how many houses were, were they, was he servicing? Um, so it's it's not like you service X amount of houses. It's basically who who calls in, you know. 
So they didn't have like, they didn't have service agreements. They didn't have any of that infrastructure put in. It's basically how many you can get to in the time period that it's in because it's a seasonal business. So it starts in the spring and we're just wrapping up right now in October. Um, and so it's, it's about six to, well, probably closer to seven to, to nine months out of the year that you actually do some work. So it was doing about 160 and then, and he didn't have any systems in place. He was basically in the field doing the work and also, you know, scheduling and doing all of that stuff. So he was extremely tired. You know, he, he couldn't, he couldn't keep going down that route. So, um, we Can bought I, it for 160. can I ask you can I ask you a question? Because I, I, I Yeah, don't go have for too it. many questions. Yeah, go for it. So when you were in the home improvement industry, what exactly are you talking like contractor? Were you selling cabinets? No. Were you So like a home, I shouldn't clarify that. Good. Uh, great question. So I was, I did in-home sales. So, and I did a lot of, I, I worked for a company called, um, uh, California closets, well-owned company. So we did, you know, uh, closets, garages, all of that type of stuff. You built out those systems inside of houses. So I did that for, you know, about eight years. And then I also did window sales, uh, windows and door sales for a very prominent company, a national company here in the Valley as well. That's what I, uh, st I actually still have my W2 still doing that. Um, And so, you know, I knew the whole working with homeowners in their space, selling them products and services and Uh, okay. go, ahead. go for it. Uh, another question I have: Why did you decide to go on Craigslist? Because I I have a follow up question on this. I, I just was exhausting all options, you know, uh, you know, biz by sell, it gets a lot of traffic and, you know, they're picked through. A lot of times companies that go on there are, you know, a lot of companies that are really valuable, they, they get sold before they even go to market. So, but those are picked through higher traffic, all of that type of stuff. And, and a lot of those guys, they're looking for a clean exit. They are looking for somebody to go get an SBA, write them a check, and they just want to be out. Uh, people that would be on Craigslist are more, in my mind, are willing to carry, be more creative, all of that. do those types of things. The reason why I asked that is because I remember when I first got into real estate and I don't, I, I'm, I don't know how long you've been following me. So this was four years ago. I, I get, I have a mentor. This is prior to me meeting Pace. Um, Yeah. mind the dog. He's just, he's, okay. No, that's okay. You're all good. um, prior to meeting Pace, I had a different mentor and this mentor specifically told me, you need to go find, you need to go buy this offer, this offer, you need to pull this list. And I was not having any traction. I was just spending all this money and come to find out this mentor was an affiliate for all these companies and she's making money on top of the mentorship that I pay for. She's this mentor is making so much money on top of the affiliates, Oh, no. uh, which I, I totally understand. I totally understand. Sure. But um, so I exhaust all my options, do it for six months. I'm going on stuff on market and somewhat, somewhat direct to seller. And I'm like, I'm about to quit real estate at this point. And then what I do is I literally go on Facebook marketplace. I, I don't know what made me do that, but I just go on Facebook marketplace and I just look up all the ugly houses home sale section and I get a, and then I find this ugly homeowner, uh, 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 <laughs> ugly house, <laughs> ugly house. And I end up getting that house under contract. My first, that, that was my very first deal. So it's, so it's interesting that you went to Craigslist because I imagine this is my guess. One of the reasons why my, my first deal homeowner, she decided to sell, put her house up, up on the market was because she did not want anybody else in her family to know that her house was being sold because it was so ugly. Got it. So she just put it, she just did it as a private sale and Facebook algorithm never picked it up. And I was the only, I was the only person that saw it. So I was Wow. like, uh, I know there's some sort of seller finance element. So I don't want to you know, expose the seller too much, but was that, was that kind of the same realm or did he, did he just not want to pay brokers fee? Well, I, I, he didn't want, well, first of all, a broker wouldn't take it. You know, a lot of those, a lot of the business sellers, their, their books are in shambles, not shambles, but they're just not clean and it was small. So the broker's probably not going to take it. They're going to probably go, you know, get bigger fish. And, uh, and I think he does, he just, He is an older generation, so I just don't think he really understand what biz by sell and all the, all those types of things. Didn't want to deal with the broker. Uh, he had one other person that was he was that was he was talking to, but apparently he didn't feel very comfortable with that individual.
And so it was, it was, it was, a, it was a, uh, it was a match made in heaven uh, to where it worked for us and it worked for him. And so we bought it for 160 and I think we put 25 down. Percent Yeah. or twenty five thousand? Uh, 25,000. Yeah. And then we got all the equipment and the clientele and all of that stuff. It was all, that was all inclusive. And then the cherry on top was, is that he didn't want to quit working. So he now works for us and it's worked very well. It works really good for him because he wants to stay working. He doesn't have to run the business. He just has to go do his thing and go home. Like a clock in, clock out kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And so obviously there was a transition period where um, he did some, you know, work and training for free. And then on top of that, um, we didn't know it initially. Well, I mean, he told us fairly quickly is that it was a, it's actually a franchise. Uh, and it, the franchise is based out of Utah. So he has multiple areas all over Utah, California, um, you know, Idaho, And so, which ended up, which ended up giving us, um, it, it was a nice, there, cause so there was some infrastructure there as far as a website and all of that type of stuff and some local marketing and all of that. But, and, and I wasn't really like sold, like this is the one to buy. I, I didn't really know too much about it until the one thing that actually made me pull the trigger beyond the financing, beyond you know, the, sir, you know, the work that was in is he showed me his call list, his call logs. And he said, Hey Don, Hey, here's 15,000 calls that we received last year. I was able to get to 30% of those calls. And so I was like, are you kidding me? So you're leaving 70% of the possible business that is available out there. That's being left on the table. And so it was a, it was a no brainer for me because, you know, working hard is not an issue, you know, uh, putting, putting in long days is, is just customary for me and my entire family. And so, um, you know, we, we met again and I don't even know if it's correct, the right way to do it. We just kind of figured it out as we went along. We just had a notary sign the agreement and, uh, he put it on a 30, 30 month note. Yeah, I put it on a 30 month note at uh I think it was it was like a I want to say like four and a half percent, something like that, with twenty five with twenty five grand down. And then uh just to fast forward to give you a snapshot of where it was and where we're where we are today, it was 160,000 gross. And then uh turns out I didn't have the most reputable individuals working for him. Okay. And Oh, so he you guys please. There was some employees, yes. How many? Uh, there was a total of three. Uh, two did not work out immediately. And then we had the one of them, one of them that was, he did okay for about half the season. And then he had some personal issues that it just didn't work out. It was best that we parted ways. How did you know those two were not fit? Was it just gut feeling or was it like you're not even working? Well, they he hired them as, as subs. subcontractors he didn't ever he, he paid them um 1099 versus w2 that's one also one of the transitions we made immediately is just paid uh you know 1099 or excuse me w2 to the employees and so we we put it out there right away um to hire more employees because it's a uh, it's you do it quickly and you make all your money very very quickly so ramping up is super important um and so we hired an employee right away with the one employee that he had, and then my brother, the operator, and then the seller also worked for us. So we went to four pretty pretty solid, actually, excuse me, we went to five that first season um, right away, and we, we bought some uh, used vans off of Craigslist, and which is another thing that I would never do again. You know, buying used is never a good way to go and on the cheap. Because they will inevitably, especially if you're talking to equipment, it will inevitably break down. And the the cost of downtime is way greater than the cost of even going and financing a nicer vehicle. You know, just, Okay. just for that example. 
Okay. Well, let me, I have not, I, I wrote down a bunch of questions. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So three employees, two of them didn't work out. And you said you, you, pref you went the, you went from 1099 to W2 right away. Yes. And I was, why is that? Because it's a seasonal business. Well, it, it allows them. So on the off season, it allows them to take unemployment. So it's more attractive to them. So you pay, so you pay them for, you know, seven, eight months out of the year, you, while they're working, they get a certain amount of salary. And even when they're not working, they get salary. Well, they don't get salary, but they can go on an unemployment as a W-2 employee. They can go collect unemployment on the, uh, you know, because we pay unemployment insurance for them. Oh. Okay. And so that's, that's, okay, that's very standard for any W-2 employee. Like if, you, if you're unemployed for a while, you can go apply for uh, unemployment insurance and it just kind of floats you by. And you get X amount of your salary. They pay you X amount of your salary, but you have to show that you're actively looking for more work. Okay, and 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 how much do you pay on your unemployment insurance? I don't know that. My wife is the general manager, and so she it's pretty nominal. It's not a whole lot, but it's uh, definitely worth it because now you have employees that are staying with you. Yes, correct. Yeah, and that's super super crucial. Uh, and then on top of that, to augment it, because we knew the cre creative financing and the real estate side of things a little bit, um, in the off season, I typically will buy a flip and have our guys just work on the flip over the winter time. And then we'll, we'll sell that house in the spring. So we do what we can to keep our guys busy, even if it's not sprinklers. So they so they would collect unemployment and uh you would pay them ten ninety nine. Yes, they can. They can choose either or if they want to take their if they actually you know what so how it works is if they if they show that they're still being paid then their unemployment can will drop down a little bit so it's okay. kind of a balancing act there. I mean, so you would just pay them cash if anything, right? Yeah, I can. Yeah, if that's what if that's what they want to do. We can just pay them cash or. Sure. And yeah, it, so, so is, is that a, how sustainable is that right like you okay let's just say i mean for five years every single you know i don't know october the, these people go on un unemployment and like starting you know april they just pick back up like how sustainable is that so it's interesting some people just have the mindset that that's what they want to do um they want to work seasonally or they'll go find something in the off season so that's that's the, that's the mere opposite of that so like um, they want to go work the mountain and as far as the ski hills, they want to go up and ski and work there. So then they'll go out and work a place like that, or, Hey, they want those months off and they want to go hunting or whatever. And it's just that demographic, that individual, that mindset. There are people that just want to work eight months out of the year. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about like them working. I'm talking about the, from the gov unemployment perspective unemployment like government perspective yeah can be you can't like i'm sure you can't just be unemployed you know quarter of third of the year every single year you can are you serious yeah absolutely oh wow yeah the only thing that is a requirement of you you can you can collect unemployment the only thing that's required of you that is you have to show that you are applying to positions and in good faith like doing interviews um but they, they can't fault you for not getting a job if it's not a good fit. And that's very common in, in all of construction. There's, it's typically seasonal also in the ag, we live in a big agriculture area where that's seasonal. So season, seasonal working, seasonal jobs is not, is not uncommon. Oh yeah. Cause especially if you live in like ski resorts. Yep. It's like, that's very seasonal. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure yep. they switch it over to something. I, mean, I don't know what they do in like in, in the, summertime well but nonetheless wh whatever it is um yeah uh, i got that um and then so you said you went to biz buys biz buy com and lubnet.com and obviously didn't really nothing really came out of it did you have any hard time finding it because when you because i'm sure like they're, they're, more, they're probably overpriced my guess and it, it, a lot of people have seen it and would and would brokers even you know be open to working with you because you didn't really have that specific uh, field and expertise 
Yeah, I mean, they, they would. Anybody that has the broker's will, it, sometimes they're overpriced. You know, t yeah, typically it's, it's, they're overpriced or they're promising more than it's worth. Um, but, you know, it's just, you know, on biz by sell, it's, it's, it's more of a harder business and they're not always what you're looking for. There's a lot of businesses on there that you just don't want to get into or that I know nothing about. you know, you know, healthcare and, and all of those types of businesses or You didn't restaurants. really know anything about this industry, to be honest. Like, Pardon? it, it, you didn't really know anything about this industry specifically. Like, you were in the home No, service. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't know anything about the sprinklers, but I did know a lot about home services Okay. and systems and stuff like that. So, uh, Yeah. you know, and then it, it's, it's a, it's a fairly quick learning curve to where you can get a tech up and running in about, uh, they can be pretty proficient in about two weeks. They can get up and running. Okay. And, and that's something that you can even do if you were to, you know, If I was, yeah, I've never, well, I did one time on an emergency. I went out and helped on an emergency uh, on a weekend, but I've never set foot in the field as far as that goes to do the actual physical work. I love, so, so obviously the seller noticed 30 something months, right? He's 28, 30 months. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'm curious to see. So I'm trying to see, understand the perspective of seller, right? Because he Yeah. owns the business, but I guess he just wanted to do the actual work. Just like he just wanted to be on the field. He didn't, he didn't want any sales call, nothing like that. And that's what he brought to the table. And Yeah. now is a seller making a salary W2 income? Yeah. He gets, he's the only, um, he's the only subcontractor that we have. We still pay him as a subcontractor. So you pay monthly on the business and you pay him uh, like a monthly something. Yes. For the work he does. Yes. He gets paid for that. And then he also gets paid monthly for the business side of things. So, so, uh, so is is the is the agreement that you have with the seller after his note is paid off, or is he gonna stay still stay in the business, or is he out at that point? I think he will. He's just that type of person that wants to do that. He doesn't do well. Being, he gets cabin fever if he's, you know, cooped up at the house. So he wants to get out and get active. Right. Uh, the other thing to, you know, to your point, you know, help, helping you understand the, the mindset of the seller. Uh, it was him. He was running it. And then also a lot of the load was being dumped on his wife to, to help run. And so I think it was causing some issues there uh, as far as relationship issues. And so he just wanted to be rid of that type of stuff. And to be honest with you, he probably makes more uh, between what he gets paid for the business and then his what he gets paid hourly. He probably makes more per month and with less headache now than he did when he owned the business. Hey guys, one of my favorite compliments I can ever receive from somebody is them coming to me and saying, Hey, Kevin, you inspire me. You inspire me to get into real estate. You inspire me that having successes in real estate is not only for the top one percenters. And, you know, I, I look back at it. I'm like, I started my first business at 19. I bought my first house at 21. I built a $12 million portfolio and did 200 creative finance deals in the lot at age of 23. And I'm getting into buying existing businesses at age 24. And I realized recently that I touch a different type of crowd. I touch a younger gener generation crowd because, you know, when, when, you know, kids don't really listen to their parents. And which is, which is a reason why I am launching the future gen investors.com. Um, so what it is, is if you guys have kids or if you know of any kids between the age of 15 to 20, I want to, I want them to fly out to where I'm at, Arizona or New York. And I want to show them around the projects that I've, that I've had in my businesses and how I operate my businesses. And one of the reasons I want to do it is because I realize that there's nobody else that is touching the younger generation of crowd, right? I mean, you look at every mentorships, like no, none of them is specifically designed for the kids. So uh, being 24 and having that little bit of more of more of an intimate connection, I launched the futuregeninvestors.com and I just want the kids to spend some time with me to know that, hey, getting school is not the one and only option, right? Like you don't have to be in school. I, I dropped out of college and look where I'm at. I will say I'm, I'm very happy where I'm at in my career wise. So guys, if you guys have any kids between the age of 15 to 20 and you want your kids to spend some time with me, go to futuregeninvestors.com, look it up and to see if you're a good fit and you know, you know, put your information down. Okay. So It's so funny that I never, that I didn't even bother to ask you what the actual business is because I know it's, it's I know the name of his sprinkler master, it's residential, yeah. it's something about the lawn. I don't really care, like to be totally yeah, honest. yeah. I, I'm just trying to get the, um, the, the, the common ground amongst all businesses. That's, that's, Yeah. that's the parallel I'm trying to, you know, match. So how long, how long was he in the business for? He had been running for five years. 
five years. And he was also kind of on a time crunch because his five-year agreement with the franchise or was coming up and they don't, they weren't because the franchise or knew this was a hot market and it wasn't being maximized. So he had some urgency there. He wanted to get it moved before it just got yanked and, you know, given to somebody else. Is it is that because he wasn't hitting the numbers? I don't know that they have number requirements. I've never seen it to the where they having number requirements. He just knew that this market was not being fully maximized. And so the franchisor wasn't as happy as he could have been. But do, but when you when you made that transition, did you have to go with the franchisor and say, hey, there's gonna be ownership change? Yep. Yeah. So we went down to Utah, met the met the franchisor, just a, a husband and wife that run it and own it. And um so it was it was pretty straightforward and just signed the franchise docs and away we went. Okay, okay. I'm I'm just looking at Sprinkler Master. Is it is it even Yeah, I mean if you just Google Sprinkler Master Utah or Sprinkler Master Boise, it'll come up. Okay. Or Sprinkler Sprinkler Master Repair. Yeah, Sprinkler Master dot repair, that's the website. Yeah, is it red lettering? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Um it looks like it looks like a decent website, whatever. I didn't even yeah. I didn't know this stuff like this existed, but it's like yeah. Almost, like a web website that I could probably make. <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, I mean, exactly. Yeah, it's not a whole lot, but you know, the thing that the franchise or does is he keeps uh the website, he maintains the website, does marketing on that side of things for us. And then we the the other very important thing is that we got Google certified. Okay. Uh, what that means is that Google, you have to send in your docs that you're licensed, bonded, and insured, all of that type of stuff. And so that will bump you up on the Google page. Um so we had to make sure that we were on first page, top two or three, um, top two or three businesses and sprinklers, and uh, and then our just our phones just just don't ever stop ringing. They just keep on going and going and going. So yeah, sorry, my dog was chewing on the maverick. Too. No, you're fine. Maverick, maverick, get off, get off, get off, 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 off. <laughs> he's chewing on the he's chewing on the blanket yeah but okay uh second question i have is how did you how did you project the revenue that it was going to make you said it was it was bringing in only like 190s it was only bringing 160k so how did you predict the future cap future income well, I knew we could do, I saw how it was being run currently. I knew we could at least do that. And then also when I saw the call logs, I was, he was leaving 70% of the available business on the table that he couldn't even get to. So you're, so the franchisor was spending money on the, on the money on the ads and they're frustrated because we're spending all this money, we're bringing you the leads and you can't even take them. Correct. Was there, was there, okay, okay. I, I can see that. And then, so when you, when you did it, when you decided to, uh, when the, when you went down to Utah to meet with this franchise or, and you told, did you have to tell him what your plan of action was before, you, before actually changing the ownership? Not really. He just saw that we were two brothers and young and ambitious. So, um, we gave him, you know, some indication, but we were just willing to go do work. So all it needed, and this is a lot of times what businesses need is they need, just need energy. They just need personnel or, you know, somebody that's willing to go put a little bit more effort in. And a lot of times the business is there, you know, depending on your, your industry or, you know, things of that nature go into it. But a lot of times they just need energy. What kind of due diligence do you do before you bought it? Or, or, or was it formal due diligence or was it just like, hey, send me your P&Ls and tax returns and T12? It's basically P&Ls and tax returns is okay. basically what it is. Because you, because you're not really looking at how quality the equipment is, right? Because you didn't really know anything about the equipment. Well, I mean, a little bit. We looked into a little bit. A lot of times, you know, older businesses, they're gonna their equipment's gonna be run down pretty heavily, um, so you have to take that into account. But you know, it is what it is. And we, I mean, we got it for a one x of of revenue, which is killer. You know, as far as pricing goes. Right. I, I think he made about a hundred. So we got about one and a half X of, 
of what they would say EBITDA or, you know, owner discretionary income, which an, a typical business is going to be sold on a 3X. That's that's the average going. It's in that industry. Yeah, in that industry. In most industries, right. they're going to be about a 3X. Uh, if you're if you've got some proprietary proprietary software and stuff like that, I mean you can get up to five to ten, but most is going to be three. Okay, let's see. Um, so how much is how much is so what have you so what, once once you use? Okay, so I sold two businesses so far. I sold one at nineteen, and I sold one just as a few months ago. Okay. First business I sold at 19, I, I just kind of sold the machine. So I didn't really technically, it was, it could have been a, like a, it could have been like a bill of sale paperwork. Yeah. But curious. So when I sold all my rentals, I, I had, I had 27 rentals. I sold, I sold it as a business, not a rental. I sold it as yeah. a business. And what I did was amendment, cha amendment change of the LLC ownership. Yeah. And then I also had a promissory note because I also did a seller finance. Yeah, so when you did that when you when because there's no title company doing there's no real estate involved. So was that kind of you just changed the ownership of the LLC with a certain S stipulations? No, so we we actually started up a new LLC and then we we get that we get the all the you know intellectual properties the DBA, um, you know the equipment you know and then we signed a new franchise agreement with the franchisor. So then that transfers over to us. What's an intellectual property? Is that, is that intellectual properties, you know, the website, the phone numbers, um, you know, any type of marketing material that they have, all of those intellectual properties come with it. Okay. And one of the most important things that you get with the business is you get their phone number because a lot of times, especially mom and pop businesses, they're answering it on their cell phone, right? So then, hey, I need that cell phone number. So it's calling me. So I get the, those calls. Uh, yeah. So yeah. things of that nature are your intellectual properties that you have to make sure that you're getting in the contract okay okay so so you you switched up the phone number did you ramp up the, i mean the ramp website was already kind of there mm -hmm. uh, okay okay so what so you close on this when we closed on it uh february of 2022 so about two years ago okay and then uh, we just we just hit the ground running. We added a team member. We actually, you know, hired a full time phone person in the office, and um, and it's it's all done pretty much remotely. So our phone person works out of her house. All the techs work out of their houses, and out of the vans. And it went from one one hundred sixty grand gross, and then our first season that we we're running, I think we did about six uh, six fifty, and twelve months. Pardon. Twelve months after that, you guys netted six hundred and fifty. Yeah, we did. We did no gross. It was gross about six hundred fifty thousand. And then in this industry, the margin is about 40 percent. What's the biggest uh, biggest expense? Probably fuel and uh, vehicle upkeep. Your labor. Really. Yeah. That's pretty much the the major cost of things because. When you are doing a job, you know, work like this, you buy the materials that are needed and you immediately tack on a 50% increase on that. So you get, you make money on the, the materials and then you make uh, obviously the labor for doing the job. Okay. Interesting. Fuel. Yeah. Okay. And are you guys adding, are you, so your, your main, all you really did. Okay. Maybe this sounds like a little, didn't mean to it's like condescending, but like not all you no. did. One of the things, one of the things that really ramped up the uh revenue was you just hit those fifteen hundred phone calls that was missed last year. Correct. Yep. It wasn't rocket science. What, was was that the only thing? Or I mean, I'm sure you did a couple other things, but was so that we, like we got we got those, uh, and then we hired good people. That's two things that you just did. That's all. You those did. are the two things we just hired. Well, I, it would really come down to one thing: we hired good people. That could go out there and, and perform on those additional 70 percent of calls that were being missed okay it's all we did and, and then and, go ahead no sorry go ahead sorry to keep going uh, and then in this industry and in, in most businesses you can really set yourself apart by answering your phone call answering your phone and then showing up on time That's it's a... not it's not rocket science 
So, so what, what would you say right now most of your business company? Is it like you say referral or are you, are you guys still hitting the phone? Uh, so that's the other thing that we did uh, also is that we immediately implemented a service plan. So people can just pay for their service for one year. And that gives them a turn on in the spring. It gives them a blowout in the fall, gives them a discount on some, some um, services. And so that locks in our revenue right there. And so I think uh, we're up to about 500 service plan members at 250 bucks a pop. That's, that's about 150, 200,000 right there. That's locked in revenue. And then we continue to grow those annually. Is it a and, annual membership? Annual payment? Yep, annual membership. And is there a reason why you don't do it monthly? Is it because it's too tedious? And if you have. Yeah, it's too tedious. People don't want, people don't like that thing coming, you know, hitting their credit card every month. Yeah. Especially, so then, yeah. Especially mo monthly. You have. Yeah. Higher. Monthly. They don't like, they don't like that. And so then it just hits every, uh, every 12 months and, uh, and they're not, they're not thinking about it. It's already, already been processed, all of that. And so that locks in uh, our, our loyalty to our customers. So they're not going to call anybody else because they've already paid a service plan. Right. Yeah. And so then we've got reoccurring clientele that, uh, in this business that it, that their system needs to be serviced, you know, some of them need to be serviced every month. And so we go out there and service it every month, you know, and how and loyal, are, how loyal do you think they are? Very loyal, especially the service plan members, especially because we actually have a, an individual that's paid to answer their phone call that we get back to them no later than 24 hours. Most of the time we're picking up the phone that day nice. and getting a, getting a text scheduled. And then we put systems in place to where they get automated texts. A, the tech tech is on the way, you know, just a level of professionalism that's not in this industry. N normally, Hey, I got a sprinkler guy and he's some guy that's, you know, you know, you know, <laughs> Yeah, smoking weed and you know he shows up in a broken down truck and he may or may not know what to do so right right that's typically what it is what's your few more few more questions and i, sure. I know it's more of rapid fire because um no i love it yeah what's your plan to exit the business if you want to exit and or are you trying to like do more bolt-ons where you like buy more service based businesses within um within that niche yeah so, you know, probably, so I would say the downside and the challenge of it would be that it is seasonal. And so I think we will run it for an additional season because the first season we did 650. This year we'll do about 950. Next year we'll probably do 1.1 1 .1 or 1 1.2 would be my guess. Just the same, same time frame, like seven, eight months out of the year. Yep. And that's really attractive to some buyers because or because they don't want to work, they don't want to work, you know, 12 out of 12. They only want to work nine or eight or whatever that is. And so at that point, um we'll at that point we'll can we'll consider you know making an exit at that point. Okay. But you're not looking to actively buy more, or you just grow what you already have. Just grow that one, and then you know, I am actively looking to and that we just like I said earlier, yeah. is that we just bought another service-based company, and that is more um, twelve out of twelve months. And we just, we just, we're gonna Im implement this, implement the same game plan on this one. Okay, I'm I'm curious because if you're only active, if you're not, if you're inactive four to five months out of the year, can, what can you do in the meantime? Like, can you do like some Christmas light decorating? So can yeah, you... that's pretty common Christmas light, but that's very that's a, that's a very short window. Because they all want it like November, beginning of November, or whenever they want Christmas lights. Right. So that's a very short window. You could do snow plowing if you wanted to, um, but I, I primarily will just buy a flip, and just have the guys work on a flip. Yeah. Or you know, uh, or you know, I bought the other company, and then I'll do some cross training. And so in HVAC, you know, heating and cooling. Uh, it gets really busy in the wintertime because people are running their furnaces. So then I'll do some cross training and then the techs can go over there and I can hire them and my, in my other company to go work over there. Interesting. Interesting. Are you farming in a certain area? Pardon? Are you, I know you're one of your biggest expenses were fuel, right? 
Yeah. So is it because is it, is it your like clientels are kind of so far from each other or like or are they... No, it's not that the far is just that you're driving. You can you can have you know we we have software that tries to keep things all in a certain place so they're not traveling uh, a lot. But Right. it's just it's just the nature of the beast that you that you've you're doing a lot of traveling. We bought additional vans that are brand new and at the beginning of this season, and they already have sixteen thousand miles on them in in a short amount of time. So. that's a lot yeah Yeah. okay um when you when, when you did the transfer did you have to go through an attorney We didn't actually. okay because it was No. very it was very mom and pop It's very mom and pop, very, very cut and dry. And, and you get a feeling for people. And, it, you know, I don't recommend this to anyone, you know, do your own due diligence, but you get a good feeling whether somebody is trying to pull a fast one on you or if they're not being transparent with everything. It just seemed like they were. you know, good people that were being very transparent and it was an easy cut and dry deal. Got it, got it. Yeah. Yeah. And are are there stipu were there stipulations with the seller finance? Because the seller did trust you. I mean, his seller finance, you know, was like 80% of it, right? Mm -hmm. So Yeah. like if, if you didn't hit the numbers, what were there, were there stipulations where he could take the business back? He would just have to foreclose if we didn't pay him. you know, his monthly. How do you foreclose it? I were like, do you, do It's you have just like, a note. And then I, I don't know exactly the procedure of how you'd have to foreclose, but you would just have to show that, or you just have to show that we're delinquent. And I don't know if there's some, you know, I don't know how you would foreclose on a business to be honest I, with I, you. I think it might be in the operating agreement where like, cause you guys went into an LLC together, right? Yeah. So you got, I mean, this is just me like kind of spitballing. Well, the 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 seller and I didn't go in the LLC together. My brother, a partner of mine, Okay. were on the LLC together. So So what I, yeah. it was just it was just a promissory note, and I I don't know. And then we got it notarized. So then he, if he, I think if he shows that we're not current, he can go. He can go foreclose and get the property back. It was a van and a, a large compressor and stuff like that. He could go get all that stuff back. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think, I think, um, in real estate, you have liens and stuff, but I think in, like, I think I have a, I have a promise, you know, with my partner and I also have a UCC lien against file the L against the LLC. So I think that's what you file again with the Yeah, LLC. I think that I think you're right. Yeah, the, the UCC that sounds right. But the but, but craziest thing is like, you, you had no, no field expertise in that specific business, but you're still able to run it. You, I mean, you, what is it? Um, just looking at the numbers, you five X of revenue basically, or you will. Yeah, I mean, by the end of this season, we'll yeah, we'll yeah, we'll almost five x the revenue, uh, or a little bit more this season. Okay, so sixty if six fifty was a gross, then you your your take home is like the the your the profit margin of thirty five percent is your take home then. Yeah, 35, 40%, correct. Yeah. And my, my wife is the GM, so she gets paid a salary. So Yeah. I think Oh. all in all on the, on just to, you know, be transparent, I think, you know, it's about each partner probably makes about, I don't know, about $200,000 a year on that. Oh, That's because. what Yeah, because. Uh, wait, please elaborate on that for me. So uh, my partner, my brother, So he's also a tech in the field. So he gets paid for what he works in the field. And then he also gets profit share. So between what he makes in the field and his profit share and between what I make as a salary, because I, I, I take a salary and my wife takes a salary because she's the GM. Uh, she, she runs it. And then our profit share, I think each partner takes about 200 grand home. on top of the six fifty on top of the salary. No, in salary included. Okay. Okay. So Yeah. And the reason I would put that in there is because those are, those are considered add backs when, you, when evaluating a business, those would be considered adding back to evaluate the full value of the business. So you add the owner's salary, discretionary salary in, uh, and then you, then the profit share on top of that. okay. Got it. Still, I'm still learning this verbiage, so I'll get Yeah. to it. Yeah. No. It's all good. Basically, the profit share is what you what you take that's not being paid in a salary form. It's Okay. just where you're taking money. Okay, so it's like 
it's like a monthly monthly distribution monthly as or quarterly distribution however however we send it out yep okay but every month you're you're basically you pay yourself like a uh you basically pay yourself as an employee of the company i take a salary or i i could would take a salary is how i would okay. do it yep and it would be the there's certain corps that you want to we want to do an s corp so it basically the, the company doesn't show like it makes a lot of money and it transfers through to our S Corp, our holding company. So we don't get, we don't pay double taxes. I love it. I love it. This, I, I got a lot of clarity out of this. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Thanks I know for it, having me. It was very rapid fire. It was very like, I, I want to get straight to the point. You know what I mean? And yeah, I love it. Guy, That's the way I work. Um, uh, sorry, no, he's, Oh, uh, you seem like like I said, you seem like the guy that would that doesn't hold back anything. So I, this is what I love about like the doing podcasts like this because number one, you know, I get to ask questions that I normally wouldn't have like, have have time to ask. But at the same time, you get access to you get exposures, right? So guys, if you guys sure. the last podcast I did with Kay, I, I posted it less than twenty four hours. It's got six hundred and thirty views already. So wow. I had you know you know this video will hit you know so maybe not as much just because I like in the, in the title of the video is I'm buying a system living for today, so everybody's interested in that. Yeah. But, I, I love interviewing other business owners because this is I'm, I'm learning as I'm doing this. So, sure. um, what are you looking for? Are you looking to raise more money or, you know, I really am looking to raise more money, you know, because, uh, what we need to do, the problem with having, uh, income like this is that you have to, if you follow any type of Robert Kiyosaki's formula, you build a business that buys real estate and then you, that buys, that spits out your cash flow. And so otherwise you get just taxed to death. So uh, I'm looking to raise capital so we can do a more of a big commercial acquisition. Uh, and I'm looking at buying a big commercial space and building out uh, salon suites. That's another venture that I'm working on right now. So I'm looking to raise capital, connect, build connections with people that want to do that, you know, that want to do uh, lending and whatnot. Got it. And then also, you know, be able to take down bigger deals bigger, bigger, bigger business deals. Got it. Um, all right, guys, th Don, thank you so much for allowing me to pick your brain. Yeah. And guys, I am looking to, I'm actually looking to buy some assisted living facilities between, th between 30 to 50 beds. So if you guys have any opportunities for me, um, email me. All right. So guys, thank you so much, Don. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye guys. Thank you.